Well, hello. Hey, Kurt. Welcome. Doesn't like my hair. Let's go with the blur. Okay. Hey, Kurt. We'll just wait a few more minutes. There's only a few people signed up for this, so we'll see if anybody else shows up. Wait another couple of minutes here to see if anybody else shows up. Uh, I'm curious, Kurt, uh, just what brought you here? And uh, yeah, you're on mute, by the way. Uh, yeah, what what uh, well, caught your eye? I, I'm 62 years old, and I think I'd better hurry up and uh, get moving if I want to accomplish some of the things I wanted to do with my life. Mm -hmm. And uh, I find myself wasting too much time watching YouTube instead of, uh, you know, trying to get things done. Yeah. Trying to get more stuff done today by uh, baking cookies at the same time I'm watching this. Amazing. What type of cookies? Uh, oatmeal flaxseed cookies. Sounds delicious. Sounds delicious. And when you say there are things you want to do with your life, uh, is there something in particular that you've really been wanting to do for a long time? Oh, I've got a list of things. Um, one of them is a program I've been writing. Um, it's a way to solve math by just using mouse gestures, so like dragging mm -hmm. and dropping parts of equations to say what you want to do or... Mm -hmm. um, 
double clicking to do something else. So I'm trying to set it up so that you can do math a lot faster than doing it by hand. And also you have the control to place everything exactly where you want. Anyway, there are some bugs in it. I learned how to program while doing it. Mm -hmm. If I didn't make them think they were in the wrong thing here during this week. So, anyway, uh, I haven't been doing much with it lately. So, I got kind of burned out, I think. Mm -hmm. Got to get back and finish it up. Yeah, very cool. We had somebody for a second and then they disappeared. Yeah. Uh, so, we'll wait just another couple minutes here again, see if anybody else shows up. All right. Uh, Hope I didn't run them off. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they didn't like being live streamed on YouTube. Who knows? Um, maybe maybe it was just a technical thing. But um, so are you are you a mathematician? And is that what you were by trade or what you were for? Actually, long time? I'm a physics professor mm. at a community college. Mm -hmm. So. I found like writing on the board, like if I just like divide by the mass of something, for instance, I got to write the whole equation all over again. Mm. So it would be nice if you could just quickly tell a computer that it just does it automatically. Right. So what I'm trying to do is use a different interface for math programs than what's been used in the past. Mm -hmm. In the past, some of them, you just had to type commands, like, okay, mm -hmm. move this over here. It uh, took forever just to tell a computer what to do. Yeah. Uh, there are some where you've got um, a palette of functions. You can go click on that. Some people have it. You click on a place in the equation, click on the palette, click somewhere else. And so by the time you're done clicking on everything, um, you know, you could have done it a few times by hand. Mm -hmm. so I'm just trying to speed things up, make my work easier. It did help me quite a bit during COVID because um, we had to go online and mm -hmm. my handwriting um, isn't very good. So mm -hmm. uh, the program and its typesetting actually made things look much better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you heard that, I just knocked a bottle off my kitchen. <laughs> no worries. All right. So I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, might just be us, which is could be great. Uh, more like a coaching session. Um, okay. If other people show up, then uh, then we'll, we'll introduce them. I don't know what happened to that one person who showed up for a second, but I'll try and leave open. Uh, leave open the meet up in case people are having technical difficulties or something. Okay. Uh, just message this person, ask them if they had technical difficulties. I think I'll go ahead and mute myself for now. Yeah, but yeah, I'll probably be, uh, you know, I'll probably be really uh, talking to you a lot if you're the only one here, but feel free to mute yourself and then go off. Okay, so I can always unmute. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I'll just start by giving a little bit of uh, background on okay. how I ended up here. Um. I struggled a lot. I struggled a lot uh, throughout my life in various ways. Um, I think two of the biggest ones that really set me on this path were I really struggled to connect with people. I had a few close friends growing up, but uh, it was very hard for me to make friends. It was very hard for me to uh, talk to women. And um, it's painful to be in that situation. And then I also struggled getting things done, uh, which wasn't really a problem for a long time because I was very smart and 
uh, my parents sort of covered for me at school. And so I was able to, to do really well until I got to college. Um, and then all my ability to, to get things done, to focus, to do something that was really important to me, sort of, uh, it all caught up to me at that point. And I, I was not able to, to make it through school at that point. I had all these big plans and I wasn't able to even, even just make it to class when I wanted to go to class. Simple thing like that uh, was just beyond me at that point in time. And so I spent just a long time uh, dealing with these issues and really trying to make changes. And what I found was this, this pattern where I would find something, a book or a technique or a, a therapist or a coach or um, uh, a productivity system. And it would really, I'd get really excited about it and I would feel it working for a week or a month. And then I would end up going back to my old habits and it was really tough for me. Uh, it was really frustrating. I was putting in so much effort uh, and things weren't working. And so eventually what I did was I started looking at what is it that makes some of these things work and some of them not work? And what is it that makes them fail when they fail? And so over the course of, you know, a little over a decade um, of both working with myself and I was doing various types of coaching throughout that time. I've been a coach pretty much throughout that time in various different capacities. Um, and I, I ended up eventually coming up with uh, this thing I now call the life method, which was just finding these different pieces and ultimately putting them together in something that could create consistent change in myself and in my clients. And so the life method is four steps. And the first step is learning. And when I talk about learning, it's a very specific thing. It's a very specific thing that I think is actually very, very rare when we talk about learning in this society. It's learning two things. One is it's learning new ways of seeing and being. And so I really had to break down what is it? That allows you to see in new ways, to 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 act from a different way of being, and deal with that. And so I did a lot of work on understanding how do you teach a way of seeing and being versus just a fact or uh, something like that, which I imagine, uh, Kurt, you have struggled with as a teacher. How do you teach? a uh, new way of seeing uh, the world. It's not just this fact, but you're seeing this through the eyes of a physicist. How do you teach that? Um, and then the second thing is what I often call cognitive emotional strategies, which are step-by-step -step, uh, procedures that you can take in your body and mind that can bring you from one way of seeing or being to another way of seeing or being. So it's both how, what is this new way of seeing or being and what is a series of steps that can take you from one to the other. And so I spent a lot of time learning uh, what's often called uh, cognitive process analysis or modeling of understanding uh, what are the steps in people's minds that allow them to do things like be focused or be self-loving or um, 
be motivated and learning how to extract those models from people in a way that they could be taught to others. Um, and what I found is that if we didn't have this step, this learning step, oftentimes people would go into therapy or something and they would work on, on their limiting beliefs or looking at their history. But if they didn't have these concrete tools, then there would be this, this uh, void. They would feel ready to act in this new way, but they wouldn't actually have the skills and abilities to do so. And so this learning step was really key. And when I started breaking down the things that I learned in this way, um, for instance, what is it that allows me to go from uh, pressure on myself to motivated? When I really broke down that skill, I found that I had a concrete thing I could work on and improve. But what I found was that even when I had a tool that I knew worked, even when my client had a tool, we know if you use this tool, you'll be motivated. If you use this tool, you'll be self-loving. If you use this tool, you'll be happy. Uh, people still had resistance to using the tool. And so that's where the second step come, came in, which was integrating this resistance. Integrating this, this thing in you that was preventing you from using this tool. And again, it was really breaking down what was it when I was able to work through this resistance to create an internal shift where I was no longer resisting something, what actually is this? And so I spent a lot of time on this, this internal process we that, that, that everybody has called memory reconsolidation, which is a tool you can use to take an emotional reaction you have to it and transform this emotional reaction, transform this internal belief, transform uh, trauma, the subconscious, your parts, however you want to call it, at the root, at the source, so that you could actually change the way you were relating to something. And for me, this was actually huge when I found out uh, that I could take these, these reactions I had that were self-consciousness or, or fear and actually change the underlying thing, the underlying memories, the underlying beliefs in a way that, uh, that I no longer had those reactions. Uh, that was huge to me. The, the, uh, the shift there was where I really started to shift not just what I was doing, but how I was feeling, uh, the things I wanted to do, the things I cared about. And when I got rid of those internal blocks, that internal resistance, I found the tools now became much easier. But the... Give me a second. The issue with that was that even though I didn't have resistance to these tools, and even though I knew they helped, I still had this thing where I had to sort of remember them. I could just forget because I was like stressed or uh, had a lot going on or just over time, I forgot to remind myself to do them and I used them less. Uh, and so what I found was that I needed to incorporate them into who I was, into my identity, into the way I saw myself. And so I started doing a deep dive into what actually makes identity. What actually is the structure of identity and how do you deliberately craft an identity around the way that you want to? And so I looked into uh, the work of, say, Steve Andreas, who does a lot of beautiful work in identity and eventually developed a number of tools like uh, Rapid Identity Transformation that could allow me to very quickly do those early stages of identity, of changing my identity. Yeah, did you want to say something, Kurt? 
No. Uh, well, uh, I guess I can tell you what I'm doing. I'm about to yeah. like grab the dough with my hands and get them all messed up. So I don't feel like, you know, if you want to talk to me, I don't really want to have to hit the space bar with dough all over my hands. Yeah, that makes so sense. So I'm unmuting yeah. myself just in case. Got it. Uh, Got it. Mm. I need to say something. Yep. Yeah. And so the final thing was this. So I started to, I, I now made these shifts. What I found was that um, when you shift your identity in this way, uh, you create this very strong identity. Um, you create a deep shift, but it's, it's sort of shallow at first, even though the shift is deep inside of you. Uh, there's there's the, this immaturity to new to a new identity. Um, what I found is that as I really took on these identities, I found that over the course of a few years, I started to bring them into every area of my life. They started to deepen. I started to understand how this new identity of being intentional would not just apply to doing work, but would also apply to relationships, would also apply to my money, would also apply to uh, the things I dressed, would also apply to the way I talked, the way I stood. And those changes often took a long time, but those were the things where it really transformed my life. Um, and so the final step of this process was how do I take that maturing process and can is there ways to bring that quicker? Is there ways to intentionally take that blooming of this identity, that flowering of this identity and nurture it so I could really have that deepening uh, of the maturity of the identity early on. And so that was where I came to E, this express the identity in every area of your life. And so the first place I really applied this technique, this life method was to my motivation system, was understanding, okay, what actually are the cognitive emotional strategies of people who have this joyful motivation. They're just motivated in a positive way. They don't need to pressure themselves. They don't need to push themselves. They don't need to force themselves. And yet they still find themselves getting everything done that they need. They still find themselves acting in ways they need. They still find themselves not procrastinating. And I broke down, you know, at first about 20 skills. And now I usually teach about 10 skills that really uh, do this. So you can learn them, you can integrate the resistance to them, you can uh, forge a new identity around them, that of an intentional person, and then you can express them in everyday life. So I didn't get too much into the specifics of my life. I am open to that, it just, this is what came out. But I'm curious if you have any questions or comments on, on anything I just said, Kurt. Um, I was just curious. Are you like a life coach now? Um, I do. So um, I live at a, a Buddhist training center called the Monastic Academy for the Preservation of Life on Earth. Um, I run the emerging technology team there uh which is trying to create um technologies that can that can uh benefit the world uh through bringing people and entities and, and beings towards awakening um and so we're really asking the question uh as we transition into this new this new data driven phase of of the world how do we do that in a way that benefits the world uh that reduces suffering and brings people towards uh enlightenment the, the buddhist concept of enlightenment and so i run that team um, i also do a lot of operations and often referred to as the director of operations there um and i also do uh this coaching which is often on uh, this type of stuff, motivation, um, as well as uh, we'll often go deep into uh, relational issues uh, and and deep into to dealing with traumas and things like that.
so that's what I do these days. Um, I really love my life. Um, I mostly am doing what I want to do. Uh, mostly moving towards having the impact on the world that I want to have. Um, and I do not find these days that my motivation, my procrastination is the limiting factor of the bottleneck on uh, what's stopping me. Uh, certainly, I still have days when I procrastinate or things that I put off a little bit, but uh, I mostly feel happy with my life and I mostly do the things I want to do. Um with it now not everybody of course wants to live at a buddhist buddhist monastery and meditate for hours a day and uh work on software in the ways i do but um but i work with clients in all sorts of things uh in more traditional careers and uh help them to get what they want as well uh, one other question <laughs> have you written this stuff down do you have a book on it um, I have a draft. I have a, a very early draft of a book. Um, it's a, got a long way to go. Um, I've also got, you know, I'm working on the early draft of the course as well. Um, I had a previous course uh, called Procrastination Playbook that I was running uh, for a while. Uh, and I'm working on this new version called Stop Wasting Your Precious Life as well as the book. So I have the early draft of the book, uh, but still still a significant amount of work to get to the point where I'd want to get it to. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, thanks for asking, Matt. It seems like I'm, I'm not going to get everything, you know, just from listening for a couple hours, but if I got like something I can refer to now and then. Yeah. 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 yeah so what I typically do with my clients is I'll send them the chapter, uh, the, the rough draft chapter, uh, after we go through a tool so that they have it, um, so they can refer to it. So I may do that after this right. as well. Um, so a few other things that I think is important to talk about. Um, the first one, is how I tend to do payments these days. Tend to do what? Payments. payments. Uh, yeah. And so the way that I tend to do this is the model is a pay what you think it was worth model. Um, and so after, after the session, uh, after the, the lesson, whatever, however you want to relate to it, um, I send out a form and the form has two questions. The first question is just, what do you think this was worth to you? you know, how, how, how much do you think it was worth? And I typically recommend that people answer that quickly and intuitively. Don't don't like beat yourself up trying to think about it and the, the marginal cost of it. And just think, okay, if I think about this and the impact it will have on my life. How much is it worth to me? And you answer a quick number. And then the second question is how much can you easily and comfortably. And again, just answer quickly and intuitively. Don't beat yourself up and really think, well, if I look at my budget and stuff, just have a sense of it. And so you answer quickly and intuitively how much you think you can afford. And then at the end of that, you fill out the form and it simply charges you the lower of those two numbers. That way, if you got lots and lots of value and you can afford and you're in a place where you can afford to pay that, then that's great. If you didn't get much value, then you only have to pay the value you got. And if you can't really afford that much, then you only pay what you can afford. Uh, so this is a way, especially when with group coaching, this is the way that I can reach lots of people and impact them. And it's also a way that I can feel very in integrity with, uh, with getting the money, only the value that I've provided. Any questions about that? Um, no. Well, are, is that applied to today, or is that uh, yeah, that applies like to the coaching section? Sorry. Um, it applies to today. Um, and again, it's so that apply will apply at the end. Just look, looking at what it was worth to you. Um, and if you're like, oh, I, I, you know, I was just checking it out. Don't think it was really worth that much. Uh, then that's okay too. Well, I um, thought it was free. Is partly why I did it. 
Uh, yeah. I'm going to preheat my oven. I'll be right back. Yep. Yeah, yeah. All right, ten minute countdown. And if it's and if and if you're like, well, I can't afford anything. I can only really go to a free event. Then then that's okay too. Simply put zero in the thing, and you won't be charged anything. Um. And so, uh, the final thing I should talk about is uh some of the. Some of the uh, the I step, the integrating resistance, some of the emotional processing work that I do. Um, there are some risks to doing the type of emotional processing work, going really deep into your traumas, your memories, your feelings. And it's important to talk about those if I'm going to be doing any of that work at these meetups. Uh, so some of the risks to that sort of work. Uh, one risk is that you can, uh, what's called re-traumatize yourself. So you can find a memory, something that can come up that you had sort of successfully suppressed and it can come up and it can uh, be, you can feel a lot of feelings around it and it can be very painful if in that moment you're not able to work through that, but instead you push it away again. Um, and that can be harmful, that can be painful. I've never, as far as I know, had this happen, but it is a risk of doing this sort of work uh, that, you, that you can be re-traumatized and this can cause um, all sorts of emotional, uh, physical issues. Another risk is that you can have a deep shift. You can let go of uh, a feeling, a belief that you've been holding on to for a long time. And then with that shift, you can have to look at your life and say, the career I'm in no longer makes sense. The relationship I'm in has to change a lot. The, uh, the way I relate to my family and my friends has to shift and it can be very disruptive uh, to your life. And so with all the work I do, but especially the emotional processing stuff, that's a risk is that, is that <laughs> you can create this big shift through your life. Uh, and that can be quite disruptive. And then finally, um, it's possible to just be a little bit more emotionally raw when doing this sort of emotional work. It's possible to be a little bit more uh, vulnerable. Uh, you might be a little bit more quick to cry or be angry after doing this work because you're just, you're scraping the surface of the emotions and getting to the raw emotions underneath. Uh, you're emotionally exhausting yourself sometimes to go into some of these deep emotions. Um, and so you can just be a little bit more sensitive in the- It sounds, it sounds like therapy. Um, it is, it can be like therapy. Uh, it has some of those same risks. Uh, and I'm not, uh, a licensed psychotherapist. So you should know that moving in. I do think I'm very skilled at this sort of work and, uh, typically don't end up with these sort of issues, but occasionally, occasionally can. And so if you do choose to partake in some of these integration, integrating resistance, exercises and tools, uh, you should go in taking full responsibility, uh, knowing the risks and knowing that uh, you're taking responsibility for anything, any any of those risks when they happen. Uh, I don't believe responsibility is like a pie. Uh, so I will take 100% responsibility and I expect people who uh, go through this to do the same thing. And so the question I'll ask, since you're the only one here, and if somebody's watching on YouTube, of course, you can say in the chat, are you willing to take responsibility? If we go into that sort of work today, are you willing to take responsibility for those sorts of outcomes being uh, being a potential thing? Is that something you're ready to take on? Um, no, I don't think I've heard enough details yet to know what I'm getting into. Mm -hmm. um, 
I was kind of expecting more details about the different methods, mm -hmm. um, what's involved in all that. Hey, let me let me talk a little bit about then that then. Uh, we can definitely go into that. Um, I think, yeah, we can talk a little bit about that in the generalities. It's really hard to, it's really hard uh, to give informed consent in that way because it's hard to, it's hard to talk about these methods without, without doing them. It's hard to give a sense of them without doing them, but I can talk about the type of things that I might do. So uh, we're talking about this sort of like these... Go ahead. Uh, you said there were like these different steps in the process. That's right. Um, I mean, what was it like four steps or something? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I guess I was kind of expecting more details about each step. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. Um, yeah, I can, I can go into a little bit more detail. So the learning step, and I was hoping to actually do this today, so you might get a sense of this, but what it looks like is... Maybe the best way to talk about it is, is an example. And so uh, when looking at people, let's talk about, uh, so one of the things when I was interviewing these people uh, and really looking at what worked for people who had this joyful motivation, was that they had this sense of self-love. They had this sense of self-love. And so what I started doing was uh, I talked to a few people who are really good at this and I extracted what is it that they're actually doing? What's If we slow down exactly what's going on in their body and mind, what is it that allows self-love? And so one of the things we found is that is that when people have coercive or this, this pushing, forcing, pressuring motivation, uh, they, they have an inner critic and then they, um, they either work through the inner critic, they just view it as truth, or they try and fight the inner critic. And what we found with the people who had uh, joyful motivation was they worked very differently. Instead of uh, either just blending with the inner critic and saying it's all right or fighting against the inner critic. They came to the inner critic for a place of love. They appreciated it. They loved it. They welcomed it. And they did that in a very clear set of steps. How exactly did they generate that love? How exactly did they express that love to the inner critic? Uh, there's a very clear set of steps and tools to do so. And then once, only once they had loved the inner critic, would they love the part of themselves they were criticizing? And so they would then find it in themselves, love the part of themselves they were criticizing, uh, and really bring that part and welcome that part. And only once they had done that could they love all of themselves and bring this sense of wholeness where they weren't one part criticizing another part. Uh, I think I did something wrong, but but I'm here, I'm whole, and I'm acting from that. And so there's a very specific set of steps to go from this place where they're criticizing themselves to loving themselves. And there's a step-by-step -step procedure you can do to make that shift in yourself. That's the type of thing we're doing. Uh, that's the type of thing you're doing in the learn phase. You're learning these very specific procedures that when you do it will bring you from one state to another state. Does that help with uh, getting more specific on that learn step? It's sure. given me a better idea of it, yeah. Great, great. Um, it just brings up a question in me. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any kids? Uh, I do not have any kids. Mm -hmm. Well, I was just thinking of the inner critic and how sometimes mm -hmm. parents uh, criticize their kids, but yeah. we still love our children anyway. Uh, yeah. You know that mm -hmm. 
may not be clear to them at the time. Yeah. Anyways, that's just something that. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And so it's finding that love underneath the criticism and working exactly with Matt. Uh, that's exactly right. Um, and that is one of the ways you may relate to this thing uh, in the reverse. You might view this as a little kid who is is trying to help you, but doesn't know the best way to do so, um, which is kind of the reverse, but, but still. Um, okay, so that's one example of learning. Now let's talk about integration. What does that actually look like? Um, what we find is that this process in the brain called memory reconsolidation is process where two very contradictory things need to happen at the same time. One is you need to be fully feeling whatever you're working with. So if you are insecure, you need to fully be feeling that insecurity. If you are um, uh, angry, you need to fully be feeling that anger. You need to fully be in whatever you're, you're working with. Well, at the same time, you need to fully be, be feeling the exact opposite. The thing that's questioning, that's, uh, that's fighting against, that's, that's contrary to the thing you're feeling. So you need to be able to simultaneously at the same time feel that nobody loves you and feel that you are loved in order to activate what's called the memory reconsolidation window, which gives you about an hour to learn a new belief, a new schema, a new way of being. And so the processes I have are about very slowly going from really accepting and welcoming this feeling to very slowly beginning to bring in this questioning to where this, this part never uh, shuts off, right? So if you look at something like uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, one of the dangers with that is that you're just questioning your beliefs right away in this way that can make you uh, fight against the feeling. Uh, and then the memory consolidation doesn't happen. You need to both be welcoming the feeling while doing it. And so an example of this might be you go into a memory uh, of when you're very young and you develop, say, a belief or a sense that um, it's dangerous to express myself, right? Maybe you were getting bullied or uh, something like that, you develop the belief, it's dangerous to express myself. And so in that memory, you can feel, you can see how it's totally reasonable as a kid to feel it's dangerous to express myself. And then mm -hmm. while in that memory, you can imagine, well, what else could I possibly, what other meanings could I have possibly drawn? And you can go through that memory and say, well, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe kids just have a hard time relating and are mean sometimes. It has nothing to do with in general, it's hard to express yourself. It's dangerous to express yourself. It's just kids being, you know, they're immature and that's not a general fact of the world. And then you, in that memory, first feel, yes, it's dangerous to express myself. And then what it would be like to say, well, kids sometimes are dangerous. That doesn't mean it's always dangerous to express myself. And you feel it in that memory and what it would be like to have drawn that meaning. And you can do that with a number of meanings until through this memory reconsolidation, you can let go of grasping on to this one belief. It's dangerous to express myself and have a much broader sense. There's much more, uh, there's, there's, there's much more nuance here than I originally done. So that's a type of thing you might do in the, in the integrating resistance phase is going back to a memory and uh, seeing through other eyes. Does that, uh, does that help with what the integration phase might be like? It's getting me a better idea of that. Uh, okay. So the forging a new identity phase um, is often, it's often about uh, trying to build one of the main things that we find really props up identity is reference experiences. You have a bucket like uh, I'm smart or I'm a good person, or I'm intentional, or I'm a bad person. And then you have all these reference experiences that you put in that. And the more full that bucket, the stronger you might feel that identity. And so a lot of these techniques are about how do we, how can we quickly 
fill uh, this bucket uh, with examples of how do I behave this way? Do I know how to behave this way? Do I have a reference for, for being this way? So that not only can I prove to myself that I'm this way, but I can draw from this well in different situations. So I know how to, how to express this part of myself. And so an example of a technique you might use in this, so there's a few techniques that I tend to use for this 40 new identity, but here, one example is the time travel technique where you can imagine, okay, let's say the quality is this loving intentionality from a, this place of total love, just acting in a way that intentionally spreads and grows and expresses that love. Okay, let's say that's the thing. Then I might imagine this timeline and I can go along and see what it would be like if my parents their whole lives grew up with this loving intentionality and, and had it fully and deeply. And then when they had me, they modeled it for me, they taught it to me and I grew up from a very young age having all these experiences of loving intentionality all the way up to where I am now so I've had, you know, whatever it is, 50, 40, 30 years of my life growing up with this loving intentionality. And how deep would that be? And what would that feel like? You know, how would all those rest of the experiences fit in to being this lovingly intentional person? And then I might go into the future and say, okay, if I was now uh, growing this loving intentionality all the way to the end of my life, imagining all the experiences I'll have from now, to grow in that wisdom as I get older and wiser to the point where I can imagine the eulogy someone would give me and how they would describe me as this lovingly intentional person and have that as a reference experience that I can now access. And then collecting all these reference experiences into this place, right? And so that's one example of how you might forge an identity very quickly is really, really creating all these reference experiences uh, through this, this timeline technique. Um, so, yeah, go ahead. I imagine these experiences and it kind of like, uh, what become something that I tend to think of as almost like a real um, situation that actually happened. Yeah, you don't quite do that. Uh, so when we integrate these experiences, uh, it's very important that you don't confuse them for a real situation. And so the way that we tend to integrate the experiences, uh, we do it in such a way that you don't confuse them for real experiences. Uh, that being said, uh, you know, there's an off thing that uh, it's very hard for the brain to tell the difference between visualization and real experience, especially if you know how to do the visualization in a way that's very embodied. And so you can get this sense of knowing how to act this way in many different experiences uh, without uh, creating false memories, uh, which is what you want to avoid. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. And then for the expression phase, um, this often involves uh, deliberately, deliberately finding different areas of your life and asking how would this new way of being show up in this area? And so you can do that in the way we just talked about where you're doing it in an imaginal way where you, we imagine different areas and then you integrate all those areas right away um, and then there's this 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 uh, step of deliberately changing your environment, or relationships, etc., taking clear action steps in each of these areas that uh, that will then come back and reflect this new way of being back to you in, a, in an entirely new way. Um, and so this is often where we create new systems, do new habits. Uh, we have deliberate conversations with people in our life. Um, there's often this process of just creating uh, a list of all the areas in my life where I haven't yet integrated this new way of being. And then you just go through the list and you check it off. And by the end of that, you've you've cleaned up your whole life in accordance with this. And there's no longer this 
uh, this distance between your life and this way of being. Um, and it's, uh, this is where uh, it goes from, oh, things feel so much better to, oh my God, my life has changed completely. Um, it's this very uh, final, final expression of all the work done in the previous phases. Does that help? Yeah, it makes me wonder, like, do you have a, like a workbook to go through this, to go <laughs> through all these steps? Uh, I do not have a work. Um, I have a little bit of that in the book, but I don't have a workbook. Uh, that's an excellent idea, though. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think this is actually a good time at the end of uh, that whole explanation to take a break. Um, okay. It's been almost an hour and uh, when we come back, what I'd love to do is begin actually teaching one of these skills from the learn step. We'll actually practice it, begin to integrate it. We'll begin to notice resistance. Um, and because you're the only one here, we'll be able to do a lot of one-on-one -on -one work in debugging if, if it doesn't work for you. Uh, so let's okay. take a 10 minute break and we'll be back on the hour. Okay. Yep. Um, and it's good during these breaks. Uh, when we come back and we're going to really get in our bodies and center. So it's good during this break just to ask your body what it needs right now. And uh, whether that's water or walk around or sit or breathe. Um, and then, and so you, you have met that need for when you come back. Okay. okay friends. I'll see you see in you. 10 minutes. All right. Thank you.
Okay. Okay, I'm back. All right. So, having gone through that step, that preamble, uh, really talking about how this all works, what I'd love to do is now go through more specifically uh, this material uh, from Stop Wasting Your Precious Life, which is a represents the work I did into how to apply this process I just talked about to motivating yourself, to doing the things that are most important to you. Uh, I'm listening. I just got uh, yeah. things going on around the place, so I got to well, clean so stuff. I'll do first is just take some time to ground before I go too much more into this material. Uh, it can be good to get your body and mind into a place that's ready for learning that's ready for growth, that's not uh, pulled by a million things. And so what we'll just do is we'll just take three deep breaths. Normally I would do something called the nine breaths technique here, but I'm just feeling the three breaths this time. And on this first breath, you're just gonna let go of any tension in your body. So just take a moment to feel your body. You can sit really upright and then relax. And then just notice any tension. And in a moment, you're gonna take a big breath in. And when you breathe out, you'll release as much of that tension as you can in that breath. So just notice the tension. Now take a big breath in. And as you breathe out, release that tension. Amazing. Now, the second breath, you just notice any thoughts and feelings about the past, about the present, about the future, anything you're worried about, anything that you're frustrated about from the past, anything that you're excited about in the future, uh, anything right now that feels like it's taking up mental or, or physical RAM uh, or emotional RAM. Just notice anything going on like that. Any anticipations you have, any regrets you have, any um, annoyances in the present environment. Just notice any of that right now. And what you'll do is just breathe in. And when you breathe out, you can try to release that, relax that. And if it helps you, you can use a visualization here. You can imagine a balloon floating away, or you can imagine cutting the cord and watching it float away. So just noticing all of that that's going on in your mental, physical, emotional space. Take a big breath in. You gather that all up. And then take a nice deep breath out and let that go to the extent you can. Release that balloon, cut that cord. 
reminded me, <clears throat> I got to get my cookies out of the oven. Okay. And then this final one is going to be about any sort of identities you're holding on to right now. Any ways that you're managing who you are right now. And so this could be who you think you are. This could be your traits, positive or negative, that you think you have, how you see yourself, that you're holding on to right now. This could also be some sort of ideal self you think you should be, something you're trying to live up to. And this could also be any sort of self you're trying to present to the world or to me or to God or to your parents, uh, whatever it is. Uh, any social self that you're holding on to. And so just notice any of these selves you're holding on to, your ideal self, your perceived self, your social self. Notice any of these notions you're holding on to. And then as you breathe in, you'll gather that all up. And breathe out, relax, release, cut the cord, let it go. And so hopefully, that was very quick, obviously, you can do this process much slower, spend much more time, but even just that little bit, you may feel a little bit more space, a little bit more time. And of course, this itself is a learning, is a technique you can use before you sit down to work. If you find yourself very prone to distraction, begin to clear out some of that space settle the nervous system and be less likely to be distracted. So the thing I'd like to talk about today is what's called the emotional gear shifter. But before that, I just want to talk briefly about the overarching way of seeing and being here that we call joyful motivation. Joyful motivation is a, a way to motivate yourself non-coercively, that is without pushing or pressuring yourself in a way that works, in a way that matters, in a way that is in alignment with what you care about in alignment with what is sacred, in alignment with the things that are truly important, and in alignment with the things that actually, uh, what, what, well, I'll say now because uh, we haven't gone through this, but the, the way we explain it, you also get the things done that need to get done. This isn't some hippy-dippy, just do what you feel like stuff. This is a way of relating that gets the things that you actually care about, including doing your taxes which is obviously the thing you care about uh, in a way that doesn't require forcing, doesn't require pressing, doesn't require uh, criticizing yourself in an unhelpful way. Of course, you can criticize yourself in a helpful way, in a way that's coming from love. It doesn't require criticizing yourself in an unhelpful way. And do it. And the way it works is by recognizing that in every impulse you have, and everything that you do, every desire, every uh, thought, every feeling, every sense, every intuition, uh, there is at least a core, a grain of the sacred, of the deepest, truest thing that you value in each and every moment. And so this type of motivation, this is not the only type of motivation that is skillful, that is useful. Uh, this is a very particular type of motivation that works through going deep into the parts of yourselves that you normally reject. But this type of motivation uh, 
works in this principle of intentionality. It's doing what you want, when you want, in the way you want, while in connection with your deep wisdom. And so it's taking any of these desires, these feelings, these things, and finding a way to connect it to one, this intentionality, this choice, and two, to this deep wisdom. And so the tool we're going to talk about today is what to do when your emotions have uh, sort of taken a life of their own. Uh, there's various emotions that people might have that can take over. So uh, sort of this depression, this emotional malaise is one, uh, deep sadness, anger or annoyance is a common one where people just get taken over. Um, even uh, some people have lots of trouble with, with like joy or mania. Uh, they can get you into this place where it doesn't feel like you're doing what you want. It feels like you 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 don't have a choice. The emotion is sort of taking over, uh, and that and in this non-coercive motivation, in this joyful motivation frame, we come from that not in a place that therefore we need to. The emotion is bad, but we need to find the choice and the wisdom right within that. Not trying to control that emotion or or discipline yourself away from that emotion, but right within that emotion, right within that feeling, we want to find the choice and the wisdom. And so there's many, many ways to do that. In fact, all of the techniques we have are sort of ways to do that. Um, but this is one specifically when you feel that that you, you feel like you're stuck in an emotion, you can't choose to do something, you're sort of just stuck in this way of being. Now, one way to deal with it, of course, would be to just say, no, I'm going to go against this, even though it's painful. Um, and there's skillful ways to do that. But in this way of working, that's not what we do. We neither try to uh, go against the emotion and fight against it, nor do we try to just let it take over from an unintentional place, from a place where we're not coming from deep wisdom. So how do you do that? How do you both uh, get out of this unintentional place without fighting against the emotion? That's what this emotional gear shifter is all about. Um, have, you ever, have you ever driven a uh, stick shift, Kurt? Never successfully. Never successfully. Okay, but you you, I mean, you get the idea. Yeah, I tried. You know, yeah, how that works. Yeah, so I wasn't uh, that coordinated. Yeah. So what you find when you drive stick shift is that uh, you want to get up at some point to you're going on the highway, right? And you want to get up to uh, sixty miles an hour, right? You want to. That's where you want to be going eventually. Mm -hmm. um, and in order to get 60 miles an hour, you need to be, let's say, in, in fifth gear. Uh, <laughs> you need to be in fifth gear to get up to 60 miles an hour. So what you might want to do, what you might be tempted to do, is say, okay, I'm getting on the highway. I'm going to switch to fifth gear now. I'm in first gear. That's 10 miles an hour. I'm going to switch to fifth gear. That takes me to 50 miles, 60 miles an hour. Uh, but that uh, does not work. <laughs> what, what likely will happen is, one, you won't be able to accelerate. Uh, the thing that the when you're at fifth gear and going 60 miles an hour, that's because you've gotten up to that speed and then fifth gear can take you up there. But, but fifth gear doesn't have the traction to get you up to 60 miles an hour. So one, it's just uh, like it doesn't get you up there. And two, you're probably going to grind. You're kind of going to break the gears 
because you need to go through all the other gears in order to get to 60 miles an hour. Uh, you just, it's, your, your car is not built to go from first gear to fifth gear. You need to go through second gear and then take that speed up and then third gear to speed up and then fourth gear and then fifth gear when you're ready. And what you find in the self-improvement space is a lot of people are telling you to go from first to fifth gear. They talk about these, these peak states and you like stand up and you're going to start like waving your arms and get yourself in this, this peak state. And then you're going to be able to motivate yourself. And what people find is that that's not really a sustainable strategy. It often burns out their engine or it just doesn't work. They just don't have the speed to sustain that peak state when they get to it. And so the emotional gear shifter is different. The emotional gear shifter is instead of going from first to fifth gear, it gives you a repeatable procedure to shift the gear into the next state that is more intentional than this one, is closer to your deep wisdom, and is more about helping you do what you want to do, when you want to do, in the way you want to do it. So that's the uh, the sort of metaphor I often use to introduce this tool. In a moment, I will uh, will actually practice the tool. We'll go through the steps. But do you have any questions about uh, anything I just said? No, I think I understand it. Um, I know the concept of using the different gears mm. and how mm. uh, you know you need certain torch to start out and then as you go faster you've got to be able to be in a gear that can handle going faster but it doesn't have exactly right the torch you used to need exactly right and so the the key principle to this tool um and one of the hard the the, the hardest parts to learn this is the one that takes the most practice is this idea of the nearest intentional state and so what I want you to do is I want you to think of a, um, a time that you've been in an emotional Been in what? <clears throat> Can you hear me? I think I lost the connection. <clears throat> 